Today is Tuesday, February 7th, 2017. We are on the video record at 1.06 p.m. At this time, would the court reporter swear in the witness? Would you raise your hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. John Phillips, on behalf of the estate of Mr. Hill, uh, would you please? Could, could I ask you to make sure you speak up? Is yes. <clears throat> And I hear what you, I can hear people speaking, but I don't always hear clearly what has been said. My hearing's not as good as it used to be. Okay. So I may it, ask you to repeat yourself. And that's completely fine. Obviously, it's important for you to understand and hear what I say. Probably the opposite order, uh, hear and understand. And I have a habit of looking down while reading and asking questions. So if that becomes a burden or we need to, you know, address so you can, you can you know, see my face, just let me know at any point, okay? Thank you. Um, pl please state your full name for the record. Chris Lawrence. Uh, what is it that you do, Mr. Lawrence? Uh, my full-time employment is as a police trainer at the Ontario Police College, which is in Ontario, Canada. But I'm here independent of that uh, role. Okay. If you're independent of that role, what role are you, what well, I'm are not, you with? I'm sorry. I'm not representing the uh, opinions or uh, policies of the school that I work for or the government that I work for. I'm here as an independent uh, individual offering um, uh, commentary, expert commentary on this matter. Is that through Elgin Security Co Consulting? Inc. Inc. Yes, sir. E-L-G-I-N. Um, do you... Uh, Where's, what's your country of residency? Canada. Okay. Um, do you have to obtain any sort of uh, visa or, or approval to, to work in the States? I have one, yes. Okay. Tell me about that. I have an O-1 visa, which is uh, difficult to get. And I've had one for several years. I've renewed it once. They're good for three. I have one that's good for three years, and it's, I'm on my second renewal. Okay. Um, how often have you worked for uh, Sheriff Ken Mascara, uh, the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, uh, in the past? This is the first time. Okay. How often have you worked for their attorneys? I think this is about the fourth case they've asked me to look at. In what sort of period? Um, two years. I don't know exactly, but it's not five and it's not one. It, okay. I would say about two years. And that's fine. Have you had your deposition taken before? Yes. Obviously, you, you're probably familiar enough with the rules that, you know, if, if you're guessing or speculating, just let me know that, because otherwise I'll assume that it was, you know, straight, straight from memory and direct. Um, and obviously we'll take turns speaking. Um, okay. What, what, is your, what, your what is your educational background? So uh, after finishing high school, I went, I became a police officer two years out of high school, and I didn't pursue any post-secondary education at that time. Much later, um, and I don't remember exactly when, some time around 1992, I was asked to teach at a uh, college um, very near my, my home uh, while I was working on the police department, and I started to teach there and, and learned that I could take college courses at a for like $25 a, a course, uh, just one of the benefits of teaching at this school. So I started to pursue a, a general arts and science uh, 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 education at what was called what is called Sheridan College in Brampton. And uh, I got halfway through that when uh, I had to stop taking courses. I had to actually quit taking a course because I had a very complex case when I was in the detective office. And then when I uh, had time to get back towards my education, I had two young children in diapers. And then right after that, I got a job 100 miles away and moved. Um, so consequently, when I looked at continuing my education where I currently live, it was very difficult to get any of the educational credits transferred. So I never really pursued anything there after that. And I also had a new job I had to learn. So in 2000, and one 2002, I started looking at going back to school, finishing uh, the process, and uh, someone I was working for had, had told me about a program uh, at Royal Roads University on the west coast of Canada 
that would permit me to apply to a master's program without having an undergraduate so long as I could prove a uh, lifetime of experience in trying to learn, trying to further my education, and could demonstrate some competencies. I'd published a couple of articles by that time, um, I'd written a couple of uh, textbooks, manuals for the college I work at, and uh, applied and was accepted in 2003 went to Royal Roads and fully disclosed that I did not have an undergrad, had not had finished anything like that. And uh, they accepted me and I graduated from Royal Roads um, in 2005. I got my, actually got my degree in uh, October of 2005. And um, so that's my educational background. Okay. Royal Roads helped me with the roads part of the R is that R H R H roads no. or R O A D S? It's Royal Roads, as in R O A D S. Okay. University. Okay. And it's on Van the tip of Vancouver Island, in British Columbia. I hear it's wonderful over there. Was that a was there any component of that that was you know correspondence or distance learning? There was a, yes. There was, I had to go out there for a residency period um, each year, but the vast majority was um, distance, distance learning and um, asynchronous posting, they called it, where we actually put things on the internet and worked as cohorts. The second year was primarily focused on uh, um, the, the research that we were required to do on uh, getting our, um, our uh, research proposal uh, approved, getting the um, uh, ethics approval from the, the university ethics board, and then starting the research, collecting the data, writing the paper, and then making sure it was submitted by August of 2005 on time. Okay. What was your master's degree in? It's called, it's called a Master of Arts in Leadership and Training. It's referred to as, a, they refer to it as the MALT degree, M-A-L-T. And it's geared towards uh, mid-career professionals as learners, but it helps you train and teach and lead other adults, other professionals, other people that you would work with. Okay. Was, was there any component of that you know, law enforcement based? Was it? It, was, it was a focus on justice and public safety. The cohort I was part of was primarily police officers, firefighters, um, paramedics. There was a couple of military people, and we had a few people from outside those general groups. But our work that we did at school uh, on projects was generally focused towards public safety and, and, and leadership in those areas. Is that a component of, of kind of ro Royal Roads Curriculum. I mean, do they focus on uh, first responder types or law enforcement? Form. They don't have a. <clears throat> not that I'm aware of. I don't. I don't know what the school's doing today. It's been 11 years. So, but um, like I said, there's a there was what they call the classic malt, and that was geared towards school teachers, administrators, people who'd work in the healthcare industry, that sort of thing. And this was the um, justice and public safety malt which was focused on firefighters, paramedics, police officers. There people worked in prisons and jails, things of that nature. So there was a focus. But I don't, my understanding was that the university's emphasis was on their mid-career professional. They did have about, my recollection is there was about 2,500 to 3,000 undergrads that were on campus. But um, what I re recall was that they were, working towards a, a niche, which was that mid-career professional, going back to school, had some prior learning, but it may have been somewhat dated in period. Um, it, it was a wonderful experience. I, I learned an awful lot from it. How many semesters or quarters, whatever, whatever they defined them, were you there, did it take you? We started in July. Uh, I remember having to do some work before I went out there for the first residency period, and that was in the month of July, 2003. I recall it being August of 2003 for the first residency period, and then we went back in October uh, to early November of 2004, and I had to have my major project, my paper, written and handed in by August of 2005 in order to uh, 
uh, what do you call it, we had to apply for uh, graduation so that we could convocate in that October. The residency period, how long did you have to spend there? It was, a, I recall it being around three weeks, three to four, it was no more than four, it certainly wasn't any less than three. It was in that three, 21 working days. They worked us on weekends. Uh, I remember the first residency period I was out there, I, I, I spent about 15 minutes next to the pool once. It just wasn't any time. I, I, I couldn't believe how much work we actually accomplished when we were there. And is that is that per semester or total, the 21 days or so? Uh, per uh, residency period. We had two residency periods and each one was about three weeks. Okay. The other, the other malt was five weeks, but they recognized, from my understanding, that it was hard to get first responders to get that much time off in, in a row, so they had to accommodate the program so they could have a residency period, but um, not create barriers. Any, uh, other than kind of the continuing education classes and seminars, any other formal education after your, your tenure at Royal Roads? Um, no, just I've just had um, gone to conferences and certainly, and we'll get into continuing that continuing education credits, that sort of stuff. Certainly. Um, what was your thesis or your paper on that you discussed? Police response to excited delirium. It, 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 summarize like kind of what the abstract, you know what I'm talking about, but the abstract, the kind of general summation of, of what your theory was that you were trying to prove or disprove? What we're trying to do was find out, um, I'd done some work, a, a lot of work before I went to school, on the problem of sudden deaths following a, an altercation with police, especially uh, you know the, the notion of positional asphyxia, taser, that sort of thing. And uh, I... Um, started collecting information and talking to various experts uh, around North America and found out that um, the notion of these things, that tasers are responsible for the death, was, was very simplistic and that there was a lot, quite a bit of complex physiology that was involved. So um, I put together uh, a perspective on it and I went to a, a number of medical people and they said, yeah, there are all these other medical issues that are not even being considered. Then um, uh, we wanted to see, okay, what do we know and what could we do to mitigate, if possible? Are there anything that we can think of? Because rather than talk to trainers, let's see if we can get a different perspectives on it. So we had a focus group with a number of experts through the coroner's office in Ontario. Um, I did a survey with uh, an identified group of trainers um, across the province, I think it was about 85 people that, and I had a very high return rate um, on the survey to get their perspective on some questions. And then I interviewed a number of people who had um, experienced one of these events where somebody was uh, out of control at the time and, and was restrained without any intent on using lethal force. And then there was a sudden and unexpected death. And uh, that led to, um, phone calls from others saying, uh, hey, I had a guy that was in this state, but my guy didn't die. Do you want to talk to me? And that was one of the things that came out of it. It wasn't so much a thesis to prove or disprove, it was to explore. It was, it was qualitative more than, it wasn't so much quantitative uh, uh, research. And what we came out with uh, at the end of it was um, some directions where we could um, uh, apply to training to educate the public and officers in, on this uh, issue to, um, we looked at uh, an alternative restraint practice to try to mitigate the weight on someone's back. Uh, and uh, we found that, uh, I'm trying to think of the other one, there's some, yeah, the educational function. Is, is primarily around in getting information, recognizing the event, and making sure that the officers recognize it in the field, and trans transitioning it from a police response to a medical response. Getting, um, there's a name for them, uh, advanced care paramedics if they were available, rather than just the, 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 the lower tier, uh, where they could give um, 
uh, an, potentially an injection uh, to uh, slow down the person's physiology, slow down their ability to, uh, to struggle, and then to make sure that they went in medical care and went to the hospital rather than going in the back seat of a police car and off to jail to be, to be incarcerated because th there were a lot of physiological issues that would never be recognized by a police officer that you might be able to mitigate once they got to em the emergency department. So it was really transitioning, that was the big thing, was transition this from a police call to a, to a medical call and get medical uh, uh, expertise at, to the scene as soon as possible. That was the biggest feature that we came to. Okay. I is it fair to say that that, was, that, that paper was taser focused? No. Okay. Not at all. Um, what other, I guess, uses of force did you focus on? Didn't focus on any particular use of force. Okay. We included, uh, there were cases that we had. I think I had a collection of around, and I, again, it was, what, 11 years, 12, almost 12 years so, ago. I think it was around 24 cases. It might have been 22, it might have been 28, it was in mid-20s that we had, and they had a variety of features. There were some, I think, that had pepper, but at the time that I collected my data, Tasers weren't really being used in Ontario very broadly. They were doing a, a couple of field tests. So we didn't really have any taser-related deaths, so we couldn't focus on taser. But when I did the broader research and, and looked at other taser-related deaths, the backstory was almost identical. Whether a taser was used or not didn't seem to be the, the culminating factor. It just seemed to be part of the broader issue. It seemed these things, these events seem to have the consistent backstory. Okay, was that paper published anywhere? It's in the National Archives, the Canadian, uh, the, the Canadian National Library. Have you produced that in, in your materials? No. Okay, is it available? It's available. Yeah. Okay. If I request it, can you get me a copy? You can get it through the National Archives. Fair enough. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you? Well, know I get, yeah, I guess I could give you a copy okay. if you wanted. Thank you. What's your year of birth? I'm sorry? Your year of birth? I was born in 58. Tell me about your, I guess, police, well, your vocation, tell, excuse me, tell me about your vocational, um, I guess, experience after Royal Roads. Well, no, what do you mean vocational experience? Where else did you work after Royal Roads? I didn't work at Royal Roads. I went no, to after, there. after your tenure at Royal Roads, where did you work after? Let me object for him. He didn't work. I, I understand. I, 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 after your education at right. Royal Roads, where did you work? I've worked at, at the Ontario Police College, and then I uh, actually I continue to operate Elgin Security Consultants, Inc. I started that company in 1992. Okay. What does Elgin Security do? Well, the, what does it do? It, um, it's a corporation that provides uh, a structure for um, the work I do independent. So it was set up in 1992 to really train security guards in shopping centers because there was no training for people at that time and, and s some uh, Businesses came to me and said, we require this for a number of reasons. Um, you've done this sort of thing before. Would you be willing to help us? So I incorporated and uh, started to do that. And then after I got to the police college in 96, I couldn't continue to do both. So after that, there was a period where I uh, basically slowed everything down to a point where I wasn't doing anything. I gave my business away to other people, friends of mine that did that sort of thing. And for many years it laid dormant. And then in uh, 2000 and, um, 2005, 2006, somebody had asked me what, if I would assist with a matter, so I did it within that case, or that uh, corporation for um, uh, tax purposes, that, that sort of thing. And then in 2008, I think, it was 2008, uh, I was contacted and asked if I would participate in some training in England and I was going to get paid for it. And I thought, okay, well then I'll do it again under this company. Uh, it makes things simpler, that's all. And uh, started to do that and then after 2008 I began to get more and more requests for, would you come and assist with training outside of Ontario, outside of Canada, and presentations outside of Canada, and then would you uh, be interested in helping with um, uh, uh, 
case evaluations. So since 2008, all of the work that I do has been done under Elgin Security Consultants. So when somebody calls me, like for this case, they don't actually hire Chris Lawrence. They're hiring the firm. Certainly. And, the, and then any checks that are written are written to that company. They go into a bank account, goes through the corporate process. I do, I file tax returns in Canada and in the United States. Um, I just do it that way. Are there other consultants or employees of Elgin? No. Okay. No, I'm not even really an employee. Um, there are no employees. If I need, uh, like, I, I, bookkeepers and accountants are paid on a fee-for-service sort of thing. I do have attorneys, and I pay on a on retainer and then a fee-for-service, that sort of thing. But if there's no money left at the end of the year, I don't get any money. Okay. I only get a dividend if there's any money that results from it. Do you know what you charged uh, the sheriff's office in this case? The defendants. I'd kept track of the time. The, uh, all I've received so far was a retainer check for $2,000, which is applied towards the work that's been done. I've kept track of it, and uh, as I sit here without the notice, I don't, I don't remember exactly how much time it was, but I did indicate a summary of what's been, uh, how many hours have been expended, and what days, that sort of stuff, uh, and also the, the cost of the, uh, the flights, the flight to come down here. What have you done as we sit here today in this case? I'm sorry? What have you done as we sit here today? What have you done thus far in this case? Um, I've evaluated the material that was sent to me in my office in, at home in Ontario. I've made a couple of phone calls or received a couple of phone calls from uh, the attorney that I've worked with, for the most part, Summer Branco. Um, wrote a report and then prepared the uh, material that was required for the disclosure so that you'd have a copy and sent that uh, on the weekend. And I flew, flew down, drove to the airport, flew down here, and then today I went to the uh, site to have a look around, orient myself, uh, take a few photographs. And I did take a video, as you know, because it helps keep things straight. Um, and that's been pretty much it. Are you scheduled to go back today or tomorrow? I'm sorry? Right, when are you scheduled to go back? I originally was going to go back today, but when they moved the deposition to late in the day, it would be very difficult to finish the deposition and also make the flights out tonight. I think the last flight's at 6 o'clock, so I'll be leaving tomorrow morning okay. relatively early. Are you working on any other cases for any other parties while you're down here? No. Okay. No. What Do you know your percentage that you work for uh, do you know the difference between a plaintiff and a defendant? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you know the percentages that Elgin works for plaintiffs versus defendants? Uh, okay. So when I work for Elgin, I don't uh, advertise. I only, uh, it's by word of mouth. I, I don't really know how people get a hold of me every time. So the majority of work that Elgin has done has been for uh, defense, uh, criminal and, and civil defense. Um, when I do, when I, I've done other work, through uh, the school, which is in the, which is part of my duties, and sometimes that involves um, prosecution case. I've done, I've looked at a couple of things from uh, as a result of being asked by plaintiffs, but the majority of work so far has been in defense. Okay, how long have you been doing the the legal con consultation, kind of the involvement in in court cases? And by you, I mean Elgin. Elgin. Uh, well, the first time I was ever asked was two thousand and five. I did one case, and then after that, it was around, uh, going by memory, um, maybe 2012. I don't think it was any earlier than that. It might have been a year or two later than that, but uh, it would be on my CV when, I, when I've given any, uh, actually done any work, so that, gives, that would give a time frame. Okay. Have you had any employment as law enforcement in the United States? You mean as a sworn law enforcement officer? Yes. No. Have you had any educational or training, uh, formal education uh, in the United States? Meaning university or college? Yes. Yeah, no. I assume you've had some continuing education seminars in the United mm -hmm. States. Many conferences, courses, uh, yes, many. Okay. And, and, and I'm gonna go out of order Somewhat, but but while I'm thinking about it, help me understand the 
the use of of body cameras. Like I have no knowledge of, of body camera use in Canada. Um, can you can you give me some edification about uh, if they're used, how often they're used, how prevalent they're used? It's uh, it's an evolving process. It's something that's only come up in the last few years. I know the city of uh, Toronto, their police department has just did a major study that they've released. It's not peer reviewed, but it was done. It was well done, and uh, they're making a decision on how extensive their body camera use will be in the future. My understanding is they want to make it fairly uh, pervasive. Um, other organizations are beginning to look at it. It hasn't been that extensive in the past, but it seems to be growing. But I can't tell you what everybody is planning on doing, but I do know that it is increasing. And, and so kind of the underlying part of my question you, you've answered, which is kind of an understanding of is it a, much like it is here, kind of a, a municipality by municipality decision uh, up there as well? Pretty much. Okay. Because it'll, it'll be the municipality that has to fund it as opposed to another layer of government, say, imposing it. Um, because that come as people are beginning to look at these issues, they're realizing how, uh, while it's a great idea, it's going to be expensive. And it sometimes is... Uh, there's a lot of things that people don't un, don't realize. A lot of c costs that come up, and that causes some to reconsider. But some are going ahead. Have you had any coursework on the U.S. Constitution? Coursework through uh, conferences, uh, yes. There's a number of attorneys that uh, routinely present on on the U.S. Constitution, constitutional law. Is there a summary of that in any of your materials? Some, no. no objection form summary of what? Of, of his coursework related to the U.S. <clears throat> Constitution. Not specifically to the Constitution. Often at uh, a conference that I've gone to a number of occasions, uh, it's called ILEDA, International Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association. There's a couple of attorneys that routinely update with uh, constitutional law at that conference. I've also uh, subscribed to a number of... Um, uh, entities that send updates through the email, Eric Daigle being one of them. He's uh, with the legal officer section with the International Association of Chiefs of Police. He will come out every couple of months with a, a summary of uh, uh, various circuit decisions and any Supreme Court decisions that might come out. And I, I, re I look those over. Certainly. Uh, help me understand, when were, you, when were you last employed as a law enforcement officer? Um, the end of December, 1995. Okay. When were you first employed as a law enforcement officer? June of 1979. What type of work did you do within law enforcement? I walked the beat, uh, drove a police car in general patrol. Um, I worked in, I spent five summers on a police marine unit on Lake Ontario. Um, policing the waterways the, uh, on Lake Ontario and the Credit River. Um, at the same time, I was part of the underwater search and recovery unit by coincidence rather than design. And that was on, that was on an ads and ease basis 12 months of the year, but the summer job was basically uh, during the warm weather months from April till November. I spent two years as a station duty off officer responsible for the booking and holding cells at uh, my police department's headquarters. At the time, there's about a thousand sworn members, four divisions. Um, and w if I wasn't working station duty, I was acting as a supervisor on the road because I was qualified as a sergeant at the time. At the end of the, that period of station duty, I was asked to uh, go full time on our tactical and rescue unit, the SWAT team. And I did that for from 1992, no, sorry, 1989 until 1992, and I went from the tactical unit to the Criminal Investigation Bureau at 21 Division and worked in, in the general assignment section of uh, Criminal Investigation Bureau. And then um, I went back on the road at 21 Division f uh, I can't remember exactly when. Probably about 94, early nine, yeah, probably 94. 
And then at the end of 1995, I uh, resigned my position at, the, at the, uh, the police department because I had to give it up in order to become a member of the public service to work at the police college because the college I work at is run by the government. So I had to go from a city employee to a provincial employee. So I, it's not a compatible position. I've been there ever since. Hey, uh, you, you indicated some degree of incompa incompatibility. Is it, again, this is my trying to understand the, the different systems. Can you do both or is there some sort of prohibition? There's kind of a way. So uh, we use what's called, the, the police college uses what's called a seconded officer. They're borrowed from, the, from their police service, but the contract in place for the people who work full time says that it can only be for a maximum, I think, of two years and then a one year potential extension. At that per end of period of time, we get currency from the road by bringing people in with experience. And when they get two or three years of um, intense instructive opportunities, plus they're updated in the latest because we have to keep up with everything that's going on around in policing. And then when they go back to the street, the entity gets back a very good trainer with lots of experience, and then we get new people. So you can come for a period of time if you're what, what is referred to as seconded, like, like seconded. Um, otherwise, you have to give up your employment with the police agency that you work for, the police service you work for, and then join the public service, and then you will become what's called a, a permanent or full-time instructor at the college. Okay. And then you stay there until you retire, ideally. How many occasions did you have while on, as, as active law enforcement, to use uh, deadly force? Well, I, I didn't use deadly force when I was on the road. Let me ask that a different way. Have you ever had an occasion to use deadly force? No. Have you ever had an occasion to essentially fire at someone uh, which resulted in something less than deadly force? No, I never fired at a person um, when I was a police officer. I've never fired a, I've never fired a live round at a human being. Is that it? Let me let me ask that question. Uh, you you said you've never fired a live round at a human being. Is that both? Is that in your life overall, meaning meaning personal uh, and professional? Well, I was in the reserve army, and we fired blanks at each other all the time. Sorry. But I never fired a live round at a person while I was a member of the armed forces. Okay, um, and that was as a reservist. Um, as a police officer, I've shot a lot of animals for humane reasons. They've been hit by a car, they're rabid animals. Uh, so I fired my gun, but under those sorts of circumstances, I pointed my gun at people. I was a designated marksman when I was on the SWAT team, so I had to do that job with the 308 rifle. Right. But I've been fortunate in that while I have pointed my gun at somebody and I have uh, knew that in the next few moments, if the person doesn't comply, I may have to use lethal force. I've been fortunate enough where I've not actually had to shoot at somebody. Now, from a training perspective, I've fired simunition, paint rounds, you know, uh, wax rounds. I've fired at a lot of people, and I've had those fired back at me, but that's, that's training. Okay. That's not on the actual road. So that's what I mean by not firing a live round at a human being. Thank you. You'll agree with me, will you not, that kind of the federal civil rights law, the, the, the use of force rules in America are encoded in the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and case law which interprets those. Well, I, I would agree that's correct. Okay. Um, and then there's some, you know, certainly some municipal or, or both city, state, and federal law that also regulates that. Yes. Well, okay. Um, how... And again, this is this is kind of coming from a complete place of ignorance, admittedly. Uh, what I want to understand is is how is it encoded, or or um, you know how does the the law as it relates to use of force encoded or or um, you know written in Canada? 
We, you pretty much answered your own question. <laughs> so Graham versus Connor and Tennessee versus Garner are encoded in Section 25 of the Canadian Criminal Code. Okay. The concepts are the same. Um, we have the same protections in the Canadian Constitution that you have in the United States Constitution with a couple of exceptions and they're, in my view, relatively minor. Uh, your Second Amendment right in this country, we don't have anything like that. We don't have the right to bear an, an arm. You can apply and it's more of a privilege to carry or to have a firearm in, in Canada. We, your third, uh, third Amendment to the Constitution is the right to refuse to billet soldiers in your residence during peacetime. We don't have anything like that. It's just not something we need. But the right to a fair trial, the right to uh, cross-examine witnesses, the right to a speedy trial, the right to, be, right to be free of unreasonable search and seizure without due process, the right to be free of cruel and unusual punishment, the right to be informed of your, of your uh, rights under the Constitution, they're embraced in the very same manner. So you have Miranda down here, you have to read Miranda rights, you have to read the, the person their rights to a lawyer as part of, of a constitutional right that's written into the Constitution. So the results are the same, the mechanisms are different. Okay. You would call it, for example, here's the, how it kind of works. You call it a, a, a misdemeanor, we call it a summary, a summary conviction offense. You call it a felony, we call it an indictable offense. You refer to it as a Terry stop, we refer to the procedure as investigative detention. It's really the same process, and it's what did the officer reasonably perceive at the time of the event, given the context and circumstances as they understood it, not what do you find out after the fact. So there's a, there's, it's very parallel between the United States and Canada in respect to how it's evaluated. Isn't the lack of a Second Amendment, though, a significant difference as it, as it relates to law <clears throat> enforcement response? For Not particularly. So really what the difference is, the major difference in my view, is there is less of a likelihood that a traffic stop will involve a firearm in Canada than there is in the United States. Because in Canada, getting a handgun is very difficult to have to drive around with. And if you do get one, then it's gonna to have to be unloaded, it has to have a trigger lock, it has to be secured, the ammunition has to be secured separately. So the ability to simply say, well, I've got a gun on my hip and a concealed weapons permit is very rare in Canada, where in the United States, people can, can get those. So the potential for a firearm to be involved is, is different, the, the opportunity. But the procedures for traffic stops, the procedures for, for interactions with subjects, they're basically the same. When I go to a training course in the United States, it transfers very simply to the sorts of uh, experience and, and work that I have done in the past in Canada. There's, there's not much difference. Is there the equivalent of the Castle Doctrine in Canada? Do you understand the concept of the Castle Doctrine? I don't understand it by oh, name. Okay. The, it's kind of the, the. Oh, man, Boyle's Simple. castle. Sorry. I'm sorry. We got to take turns. Uh, essentially, the right. Does a Canadian citizen have the right to have a firearm at home? They do. Without any, is there any sort of approval or or. Um, registration of that? You have to have a personal acquisition license to acquire a firearm, and that's a federal uh, process, but once you have that, you can go and buy a, a rifle or a shotgun um, for hunting, one that you'd use for hunting. Um, and you can keep that in your residence, you just have to keep it safely. Can you have a pistol uh, or a handgun in your residence in Canada? You can. How? Uh, you have to get a personal acquisition license, and then you have to take a safety course, and then you have to apply for a restricted weapons permit, and uh, you then can buy certain weapons that fit within certain criteria. You can't buy a, uh, for example, you can't buy a firearm with a two-inch barrel. You can buy a firearm with a, with a four-inch barrel or longer that's a handgun, uh, but it must be uh, kept safely. What does that mean under? Canadian standards, what is kept safely? Well, they, they don't want ammunition to be in the gun, they want the gun to be unloaded and the ammunition to be kept separate and they want the gun to be locked up in a secured, secure location so that uh, you know if somebody gets angry quickly, it's not at your fingertips kind of idea. Okay. Did 
you bring any, I don't know if I, I can't remember if I asked, did you bring any documents with you today? I did. I brought the doc. I brought the originals of the documents you have copies of. Okay. Where is that? They're in my briefcase okay. in the other part of the room. Very good. Uh, just for the record, uh, I recently got a, I don't recall if it was a deposition or it was a statement from the lady who made the phone call. I was only given that the other day, so that's not on the list of documents I've reviewed. But I don't think there's anything that I have reviewed that isn't on that list of documents other than that one item. Fair enough. So you would basically, of the materials you re reviewed, there would be one more statement. Um, yes. And, and certainly the inspection today would be something at least additional that you performed. Correct. Uh, what significance, if any, did the inspection today have? Generally, what my experience has been doing site visits are, and I don't think anybody does this intentionally, it's just the way it works. I get a perspective from that was taken by the camera, and when I go to the actual site visit, distances seem to be closer than what they appeared on the, the, the picture. So I find it helpful to go to see what the relationship is between, like today, the front door and that garage. How far apart are they really? Where on that garage really are they? Um, because you get a port, a, a, you get a, a picture. You know, people say a picture's worth a thousand words. I think the visit actually does more than just, it adds uh, meaning to those photographs, much more meaning to the photograph. It gives me a, a good idea of relative size and distance. Is there any intent as we sit here today to amend your report based upon the site visit today? Any opinions changed? I, I, don't, I don't think so. Not as I sit here. Uh, I don't think there's anything that's going to change in my report. There's things I understand better. Um, but I don't think it changes my opinion. What do you understand better? Um, where Mr. Uh, Hill would have had to have been standing in order to be struck by those rounds, how far over to the one side he would be. I thought those holes in the door were a little bit more towards center. It was helpful to see that how far over to the one side they were. That was helpful. Um, the layout of the house and how the officers would have come in the house after they did the entry, it was very confusing because I had no sense of what flow those pictures would have been taken in. They were just kind of taken. I don't know if this one was before that one. So sure. that's one of the reasons I, I took the video and walked through the house was to help me remember what the relationship of rooms were. Why didn't you attempt to open the door or close the garage door with one arm? I don't think I needed to. I think I, I understand how it could be done, but I also didn't want to damage the residents, and I didn't want to upset um, the lady I believe to be Mr. Hill's mother. Um, I was sensitive to the fact that she was a little distraught today, and I just thought a lot of banging and crashing um, wouldn't help. So I, uh, it was in deference to her, number one. Number two, I don't think, I, I could have done it, I, but it would have made an awful racket, and I just, didn't think it was going to be necessary. You'll agree with me for purposes of today that you did not attempt to open or close that garage door with one arm. I did. I stood inside and I did try to close the door with one arm. And I did try to open it from the inside with one arm. But, you but didn't. I didn't slam it down because I didn't want to upset. Uh, and I apologize if it's not her, her correct name. I didn't want to upset Mrs. Hill, Gregory's mother. I, uh, if that's not her name, I apologize. But Mrs. I didn't, Bryant, but her name there you Bryant. Bryant. Uh, that's what I mean. I, I, that's I can't keep name. everybody's name correct, but I didn't want to upset. The, I didn't want to upset his mother, and uh, oh, um, I didn't want to cause any damage either. Okay. <clears throat> Have you listened to the music that was uh, allegedly playing on the day in question? No, what do you mean by that? Have you listened to the songs that were allegedly playing? There's a CD right. that, that I think we would all generally agree was, was playing at the time. Okay. I did not hear, the, I, do, I never got a copy of the CD, so okay. I, don't know what, I don't know what was playing. But I could hear music on the eight hour long um, uh, audio recording that I was asked to listen to that the was the channel the officers were talking on. I could hear some back music in the background, but I can't make out any, 
I don't know who it's by. I don't know what song it is. I, I don't know anything about it. Did you hear anything that, that rang to you as obscene? I couldn't make out enough of it from the recording that I had. Why didn't you try the um, stereo today? I thought about it. Um, again, I didn't want to upset anybody. I didn't want to crank the music up to schools across the street. Um, I'm not here as an expert in sound. Uh, you can, I believe that you can hear on there, but that'll be for the triers of fact to really make a decision. Uh, I, it, my opinion doesn't turn on the uh, on the volume or, or, or something of that nature, so I didn't really think it was necessary today. Would volume be relevant to what either, I guess, would volume of the music be relevant to what could be heard by any of the parties involved in the shooting? It might be. It might be. Okay. But you could, you could, my suggestion would ask, you'd ask the people that were there what they heard and what they couldn't hear. Northeast, south, or west, or some other direction. Do you know, based upon your inspection today, or, or based upon your inspection today, what is your opinion of what direction Mr. Hill was facing at the time he was shot? The, what direction he was facing? Yes. Um, he, w I believe, he was facing towards that door, towards the door, flush with the uh, opening uh, and closing of the door. Do you know whether that's northeast, south, or west, or some subpart? As I sit here, I, I may be incorrect, but I think North was uh, towards the left, but I would have to go back. It's, I, I have, I'm not 100% certain in my mind as I sit here right now. I have looked, I've gone to Google Earth and done the overhead view to try to figure out North, South, East, and West. Um, and I, as I sit here, I just can't recall precisely which direction the, it is. The direction on a compass do you know which direction uh, either of the officers were facing, either Officer Newman or Lopez? My understanding is, my recollection is that Lopez was standing kind of northwest, facing in towards the garage and up towards the corner, and Newman was more towards the front door, had been to the front door and had moved back. So he was facing... Uh, Okay. North. So he was facing. Okay, that's north, east, north, south, west. Um, like I said, I, I using the compass. I'm not exactly sure which direction is north, which direction is south. But the the garage was off to Newman's right, and Lopez. Uh, facing the door was more to the right of the door, so the, the majority of the door was in front of Lopez and to his left. Do you know where the sun was in the sky at the time it of was, the shooting? It was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so it would have been to the south and to the west, but relative to where that the house is sitting, I'm not 100% certain. In your report, you indicate Deputy Newman was not able to hear whether or not Mr. Hill or Deputy Lopez said anything due to the loud music playing in the garage. I'll say that again. Deputy Newman was not able to hear whether or not Mr. Hill or Deputy Lopez said anything due to the loud music playing in the garage. That's what Newman claimed. How far apart was, at the time of the shooting, how far apart, in your estimation, was Mr. Hill from Deputy Lopez? I'm not certain because Lopez, his explanation wasn't clear in the record as to whether he was four feet away from the garage or, or 14 feet away from the garage. It wasn't clear. But he'd said he had moved, he had moved down, down the driveway from the position he was standing. And at some point, he was close enough, he said, to ta he tapped on the 
the garage with either his closed hand or his open hand, I can't remember which. And then he said he took a couple steps back and when the door opened up, he stepped back a couple more steps, but he was never definitive as to how far back that was. How far away was Deputy Newman from Mr. Hill at the time of the shooting? Well, again, Deputy Newman had gone to the door and then somewhere had come back between the door and the edge of the driveway. So the angle of the, and the defects on the door I look, that I looked at seemed to line up with uh, a point in front of the uh, light that was on the front lawn. And if you extended the line from the defects in the door to in front of that light to a concrete pole on the opposite side of the road in front of the school, that gives you a, a general direction of, of alignment with the bullet holes. So. Um, Newman would have knocked on the door, closed the door, and then taken a couple of steps back, and I think more kind of towards the door. But precisely where he was, I can't say. Have you testified uh, as an expert in any American court of laws to bullet trajectory um, or um, you know forensics of bullets being fired? I testified. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, did you? I made an objection to form, but you're going to answer. Okay. I uh, testified in the case in Utah where uh, a woman was shot in the head and uh, I talked about those sorts of things but I didn't do a shooting reconstruction. I testified in the case in Alabama, a federal um, uh, civil case, on uh, uh, an incident where a <coughs> man was shot in the hand by a municipal officer, a police officer. Um, those are the two cases where I've testified in court and I've testified at uh, a number of depositions um, in relation to shootings. Okay. So bullets have been part of it. Certainly. To continue my questioning from before, do you know how far apart uh, Deputy Newman and Deputy Lopez were from each other at the time of shooting? Not precisely, no. Given your inspection today, do you have an opinion whether the music or noise or whatever coming from the speakers would have been louder from inside the garage or outside the garage? I, I wouldn't know that. Okay. Would you mind if we took a break? For I don't mind at all. Completely. I just want to get a drink of water. Off the record, 159. Back on the record, 106, or 206. You do some analysis, sir, on, on the timing on a service revol service Glock, I guess, um, as to kind of what can be done. Do you have any specific analysis that you've performed on this case as, as to the timing of the sequency, sequencing of shots? Um, on this particular case, you know, maybe I'm not understanding your question, but the, I agree with the sequencing that everybody seems to think happened, which was the first shot was the lower one, the next, and the, because the door was coming down. That's logical. I think that's consistent. Okay. As far as the timing, how far apart they were, do you have any opinions? Yeah. Um, using experienced police officers, the research suggests, and I've confirmed this independently by timing experienced officers myself on an actual range with a uh, camera at 30 frames a second, someone firing a, a pistol like a Glock, the time frames uh, for shot cadence, if you will, the time between shots would be, it would be helpful for the jury and the court to understand that 0.2 to 0.3 is a relatively reasonable uh, amount of time for an experienced officer to cycle the weapon. The, the um, 
quickest I've ever seen two shots ever fired by anybody was .12, and I've only seen that once. <laughs> so are there anomalies? There might, there might be. But generally, you're, the time is there to illustrate or uh, assist the triers of fact in understanding how rapid this may have been, how quickly the door might have come down, how rapidly the, the shots might have been fired, what was the duration of this event, so that they can then understand the evidence. Is it a reasonable, based upon that analysis, is it a reasonable assumption that the four shots would have taken about between one-fifth and a third of a second each, or between each? That's, re yeah, that's a reasonable number uh, that everybody could be guided by. I don't think there's, uh, it's unlikely that it was 0.5 and it's very unlikely that it was 0.1, um, but you know, 0.2 to 0.3 is pretty good. In your inspection today, did you see any of the blood matter, skull matter, or brain matter on the door itself? I saw something on the inside of the door, yes. Right. I don't know what exactly what it was. Where did you see it whatever you saw? Higher on the wall, on the inside of the door, um, near where the, where the uh, defects on the door were. At the highest shot or at, at other shots? I didn't really look in great detail. I was making sure the, I was looking for the bullet wipe on the, uh, on the um, defects. I was looking for um, more the weight of the door, that sort of thing. I knew that it had been there from the photographs. It was pretty apparent there, so I didn't really look to see if it was still there or if it had deteriorated. So I don't know to what extent. The wipe is that is I mean, is that kind of how the how the bullet hits the door and the impression that it leaves? Yeah. Help me. What is I'm the wipe? Judging. Fair. Sorry. What is what is wipe? So there's what there's something that's known as bullet wipe on uh, on an entry uh, an entry of a, a bullet through a medium. Um, in this case, when a bullet is fired, there is uh, even though people try to clean the barrel of their weapon, there's going to be some fouling that's in there. Uh, there's also um, uh, soot and unburned powder in that that's picked up with the bullet because the bullet's actually a little bit smaller than the barrel. That's so that it fits in with the lands and grooves and starts to turn and twist as it comes out. As it comes out, the bullet has some soot, some unburned powder, some oil, grease, things of that nature on it. As it's spinning through the air, once it strikes an object, in this case that door, it's going, it, as, as it's turning, depending on whether it's right twist or left twist, it's gonna hit the door and there's gonna be a ring, like a collar left that, that tells you which direction it came from. And uh, despite the time that there's been between the incident and today, and despite the uh, elements that the door's been exposed to, there's still evidence of that bullet wipe on the uh, leading edge of the of the door. So I, I looked to see if it was still there. I was interested to, if it would last that long, and on that door it actually did. The, the bullet impressions to me almost have a kind of a, a snow cone-ish shape. Do you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's, there's a round part and then there's yeah. almost a triangular part. Right. What causes the triangular part? I, I couldn't tell you. It's, it's, that's a physical thing, but okay. um, it's, that's typical. Um, the bullet wipe will tell you which end. Besides, the other thing to consider is one of those rounds, in, well, one round hit between two uh, portions of a bracket that uh, support the door and um, allow it to articulate and was trapped in there. So it could only come from one direction. It couldn't come from the other direction. Right. The other uh, next one, I think it was the second shot, it, there's, there's a, th the bracket on the door is fixed so there is a, the pieces are inside. That's the part that trapped the first shot. The next shot, if the back of my hand that's, let's say that's the edge of the door, forget my wrist. There's a bullet that actually almost touched that. It had to be going this way, because if it was going this way, it would have hit that. And then secondarily, it, uh, there was one of the bullets uh, went through Mr. Uh, Mr. Hill and hit the concrete wall that was behind it. And that 
alignment with one of those uh, defects on the concrete and one of the uh, defects on the door, they're not in exact alignment, and that's not unusual for a bullet to slightly change and deviate because it, it will tumble as it goes through the body. It hit the wall there, so that tells me that those shots, the bullet wipe, the, uh, the way it went through the door, the mechanisms that it had to, uh, um, I don't want to say navigate, but pass by or, or, or pass through uh, are all consistent with shots being fired from the position that Deputy Newman was in. Do we agree on the point that the door was coming down as the officer was firing? I, I would, uh, I'm sorry, objection four. The garage door was, I believe the garage door was on its way down as the bullets were passing through. Okay. Do you have an opinion as to how far the garage door was off the ground when the highest... The first round? The, 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 I guess the last round struck through the door. Um, what would be helpful to know, and it's one of the reasons I went, I wanted to know if there was any elevation change between the front door and the sidewalks, so to speak. And was there a, a decline there? And I, I guess given that it's Florida, and you don't have any ski hills here. It didn't kind of isn't surprising to find out that that ground was fairly leveled there. So, even if he took two steps back, Officer Newman, I don't think would have lowered, you know, wouldn't have gone down a hill, so to speak. So he would be firing at a consistent position at each time. Um, so you'd have to know how high the firearm was when uh, Deputy Newman believed he was firing it, uh, and and then you could make some determination because if you knew how high the pistol was, then you could um, put two pieces, basically take two pieces of paper, draw, mark from the bottom of the paper up to that height, and then in a straight line, basically, and then put another piece of paper with the numbers marked on the other side and put the two together. I, I was playing with this, but I can't conclusively state anything because I don't know how high the pistol was, and I didn't know at the time I was doing this whether that was level ground or not level ground, just getting an idea. That would give you a sense <coughs> of where that, that, that door was. But um, Mr. Hill was six foot one. I'm about six foot three, and I stood behind the door in that position, and my head would have to be forward. So either Mr. Hill would have to lean forward for that final round to strike him if the door was completely closed, or if the door was up, that would permit Mr. Hill to still be standing up somewhat relative, because I'm not exactly the same height he is, and, uh, and I don't know what posture he had uh, adopted as a result of the first two rounds that struck him. Okay. So it was either closed or, or near closed, but I can't say for certain um, how much it was open. See a water hose in the garage? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Did you see a water hose in the garage? A water hose in the garage, not that I recall. Did you see a, um, let me ask this, in, in Canada, the, the spray nozzle that attaches to a water hose, what's that called? Nozzle. Okay, fair enough. Um, kind of saw that coming. Uh, did you see one of those in the garage? I didn't, wasn't looking for a hose. I was looking at the garage door, the rel relationship between the door and the other interior door of the residence, the height of the, I wasn't inspecting the, the, the contents of the garage. Those two items that are common in a garage. Sorry? Are those two items that are common in a garage? Um, I've got an interior hose in a, um, inside my garage in Canada and it's got a uh, spray attachment on the end of it.
are you aware that Mr. Hill's daughter saw all of these events? No. Have you read her deposition? I, no, I haven't. I'll tell you, it hadn't, you hadn't because it hadn't been taken. No, they, they were very young children. Did you read the depositions of the other witnesses, the eyewitnesses? I, re I read depositions from teachers across the street, and I read depositions from relatives who uh, were nearby and came afterwards, but I, um, that's pretty much what I had. Other than Officer Newman uh, and Officer Lopez, did you read any deposition or any statement that put a gun in Mr. Hill's hand at any point? I recall members from the, the SWAT team after the entry, some commented on a, a gun in the pocket, but um, not everyone did. And, uh, but that's it. There were only police uh, depositions and, and information that touched on that topic. And the converse is true too, that there were SWAT members that actually didn't see a, a gun <clears throat> in Mr. Hill's, uh, Mr. Hill's dead body. Correct. Four. Would it be important to secure a, a firearm, um, particularly one that may be involved with a crime, uh, at the at, as a part of an investigation? Generally, yes. Okay. You know why that wasn't done here initially? I can understand why it wasn't done. Why? Well, when you're a tactical officer, you're not an investigator, and you don't want to foul up uh, a criminal investigation. Your job, really, as a SWAT member in this circumstance is to make an entry and make sure that the house is clear, nobody else needs assistance, and that there's no further danger. As far as moving evidence is concerned, I understand why Mr. Hill's body would have been moved to check on his... Uh, his circumstance, his state, and whether they could do anything. After that, um, as a SWAT officer, I wouldn't personally, I would not be touching or moving evidence if I could avoid it. Now there's exigent circumstances where it must be done, but in this case, there was no one else in the house and I don't think it, it really needed to be done. In respect to uh, the two that were checking the body, they would have one perspective the others would be farther back, and they were, their jobs would basically be what's called long cover. They would be looking for other threats while two people are focusing on this. They're kind of scanning the background to see if anything sudden comes be up as a risk, because that's their job. Their job isn't to attend down here. So the fact that two other people back here didn't see it, uh, I, I would understand how that could happen, because I've been in that sort of situation. Um, documenting it, some, uh, as, as a member of a, a tactical and rescue unit or a SWAT team, generally you will do a broad stroke, um, we call them gun sheets on our team. You know, we were called to this type of an event, these are the resources used, this is the time, uh, amount of time we were there, this is a broad stroke of what took place, um, this is the occurrence number. We'll make some basic notes, I came, I saw, I left, I did this, and if I touched any evidence, I'd make a note. But you're not supposed to impact the scene so that criminal investigators can then come in, and in this case, yeah, they're gonna secure the firearm, they're gonna identify it, they're gonna photograph it, and you don't wanna have, have to explain how much you moved it. Do you know if pictures were taken before uh, an officer rolled him over to see if there was a gun in his hand? I, I don't know. My recollection of this was they couldn't get the robot started. They made a determination that they need, according to the after action report, they made a determination that they needed to go in to check for, there's a variety of reasons for going in. So they used the, uh, the uh, gas for the house uh, to increase the safety. Then they went in. The probe was placed in the door, I believe, prior to the team entering from the back. But I don't know precisely when the photographs were taken. As I sit here, I don't precisely know when the photographs were taken. Okay. Do you have any opinions, or are you, I guess, 
And, and can I just clarify? Yeah, sure. That's the I'm talking about the photographs that were taken by the robot. Right. Obviously, the crime scene photographs were taken much later. Certainly. Um, do you have any opinions? Well, strike that. Do you, do you have any medical training? Uh, nothing beyond a first responder. Okay. Do you have any opinions on what Mr. Uh, Hill would be able to do or not do with a level of intoxication above 0.3? Just my experience of as a police officer, and, and that that depends on the individual. I've seen people that blew very high the, in the point three range, and I was surprised that they. But there are people with experienced drinking uh, backgrounds; they didn't seem to be affected by much. And at the other end, I've seen people with relatively low concentrations have great difficulties. So it depends on the individual. There's there's, uh, there's no way you can say without knowing the person. In what? kind of education or training do you have in the forensic science related to uh, the effects of um, alcohol on biomechanics or body mechanics? Other than just my experience, no, no formal training, but other than just my experience with people who are intoxicated <coughs> Very in my duties. Related to the nature of the the head injury, the bullet that struck the head. Right. Do you have any opinions regarding what level of I I mental incapacitation that would have caused? Uh, only what I referred to in the uh, um, report that I wrote, and that comes from the literature around wounding, um, because we use it to inform our training, and that is that unless the brain stem is uh, involved, traumatically, or unless a, uh, uh, a, the spine is severed at a particular spot, the person may be able to function for a period of time, but then that, that capacity and that time frame uh, varies. But death is not always instantaneous, um, and people may be able to move for a, a, a period of time following that. But again, that's just what the literature talks about. And uh, as a trainer, we make sure that police officers understand that unless you see them fall or they give up or say they're giving up, that uh, one or two shots may not incapacitate an individual. Are, are we in agreement that if the gun, the, I guess, Caltech gun, was either not in Mr. Hill's possession or in his pocket at all times, that this would have been an improper use of force? Four, go ahead. If Mr. Hill didn't have a pistol, then the perception of the officers was flawed. If Mr. Hill's, uh, if the pistol was in Mr. Hill's pocket the entire time and he made no effort to retrieve the pistol uh, or move in a manner consistent with retrieving the pistol and apparently getting prepared to fire, then uh, lethal force should not have been used. Do you have an opinion related to, or have you expressed any opin opinions related to the lack of any um, body or blood matter, blood, blood splatter, uh, residue, um, gunpowder, or any real foreign matter on the Caltech? Objection form. Um, I, I'm not a blood spatter expert. Um, I uh, did make some uh, review to see if I could learn anything from it because I, uh, you know, that I saw that your expert had made a comment on that. But uh, <clears throat> if the gun is behind somebody, I don't know how that impairs because I, I don't know exactly how the uh, blood erupts. I'm not an expert in that particular area. So I didn't put any opinion of that nature in my report. Okay. Did you take, I assume you reviewed the depositions of, of Officer Newman and Officer Lopez? Yes. Um, did you see comments about Fort Pierce 
being in decline or, or um, you know, being, this being a bad area or, or comments of, of kind of similar nature. Form, go ahead. Um, I don't. I wouldn't characterize it as, as it's a bad area. It was seemed. To, it seemed to be that the comment was, yeah, it was. It was an aging part of the community. It was an older part of the community. Um, houses, um, you know, need to be um, updated, renovated. It's, you know, it's an older section of town. That sort of thing. Yes. Did you see anything which arose to the level of racial bias? Form. Go ahead. I, in my view, no. Anything that arose to the level of... Um, Can you speak up, please? Sorry, anything that arose to the level of, of uh, racial prejudice, prejudging? Form. No, I wouldn't say uh, racial prejudice, no. Okay. Have you conducted any studies on... I mean, it, it, strike that. It, it, I'm certain you've, you've you've heard of this whole Black Lives Matter type movement and the the strife between um, African American citizens of the United States and and law enforcement. They have a Black Lives Matter chapter in Toronto. Do they? Yeah. Um, have you done any studies? Uh, Related to um, kind of the interplay of 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 bias, prejudice, and the use of force. Four. Um, I'm aware that there is a training that's been offered, uh, being offered in the United States, and it's being funded uh, out by, uh, I believe, a government entity, but I can't tell you which one, in relation to uh, bias-free policing. And there is the that is that is a perspective that is being that is held being held out that there is a, a, his, a history of bias uh, that has to be encountered. There was some research done by some Harvard professors that say that everybody has an inherent bias, and, and I get that. Um, so I'm aware of it, uh, and I'm uh, I, I know about it. But I'm not an expert in it. Okay. I, I don't teach it, but I'm I'm familiar with it. Okay. If the Caltech found on the scene in Mr. Hill's possession was not in his hand, would there have been an imminent deadly force to Officer Newman, Officer Lopez, or any other individual? Or uh, it would depend on the context you know, if it's if nobody knew it was in his pocket, and um, then how would the officers know that there was a that he had the weapon? Um, but if it's in his pocket and his hands going back towards it, and they know it's in his pocket, it, it could be, because it wouldn't take very long to produce that. But if it's if it's not apparent, if they don't know he has it, uh, and it happens to be in his pocket, there's no way they would know that it would be it, that potential would be imminent. I'm not picking on you for this next question. I know in some jurisdictions it is. Is, is sh sheriff spelled differently in Canada? I have a friend who spells his name differently than the sheriff, and it creeps in every time, and I try to catch it in uh, in um, my proofreading. No, it's not supposed to be spelled differently. Okay. Two I'm R's a, and two F's is incorrect. There was somebody I worked with that had that name Fair spelled enough. that way, and it comes out every now and again. I apologize. I, I do it too. You know, so. Is it legal in the United States for somebody to go to their own front door with a firearm in hand? Four. Um, 
That's a question of law. Which is why I objected. To the extent you're basing opinions on it. What is your understanding of, of the law as it relates to the ability of a person to go to the front door with a firearm in their hand in the United States? My understanding, at least for Florida, is con uh, concerned. I understand that you have a stand your ground statute, which would permit Mr. Hill to go to the front door with a gun in his hand. The type of shooting exhibited by this officer through a garage door, is that in accord with police training? Form. We don't encourage shooting through a medium if that's avoidable. Um, and I don't know anybody who actually has a, a barrier that slides out um, while shots are being fired. Um, but I think what you're dealing with here is more along the line of um, it takes time to react and in that time things have changed before you can stop and realize ob objectively or oh, I have a different set of circumstances. I think this whole, from the time of the first shot to the last shot, you're talking about a second. Do you know how many seconds would have passed from the time there was the, I guess, perception of a firearm in, the, in Mr. Hill's possession to the point of firing? I have an estimation based on the visit today. It would be maybe two, maybe three seconds. It may be a second or two more. It certainly wouldn't be, I don't think it would be one second, but it's gonna be that two, three, maybe four seconds. This was a relatively rapidly un 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 evolving event. <clears throat> Do you agree that by closing the garage door, Mr. Hill was de-escalating the situation? Or, in retrospect, that, that may be exactly what happened. Did Lisa McGuire, did you review the deposition of Lisa McGuire? Is that the lady that made the phone call or is that the teacher, one the, of the teachers? I'll defer to your judgment. Well, let me just ask you this way. Lisa McGuire, Donna Hellums, Hellum. H-E-L-L-U-M-S, yes. Stephanie Mills, Shirley Fowler, Elizabeth Enrique Ruiz, did any of those individuals see a gun in Mr. Hill's hand? Um, I can't say specifically what each one of them saw, but the general tone was that the, the civilian witnesses did not really see what happened. They noticed the garage door go up. They saw, some of them noticed that the deputies were, seemed startled. Some heard shots, some did not, but nobody really saw much of Mr. Hill. Couldn't the act of a garage door just going up suddenly be a startling event? For it may, uh, but you know, a garage door going up when you're knocking on it in and of itself shouldn't have really startled a, an officer. Um, you're knocking on the door, you're expecting a door to open at some point. What did you, um, do you agree with the statement, deadly force is never used as a compliance technique or an arrest technique? For? Well, um, I agree that it should not be used as a compliance technique. Uh, it may be part of an arrest outcome but, you know, the intent really is to defend or stop a threat as opposed to effect an arrest. The arrest may follow.
You agree that the use of force is Sorry, not, could you speak up? Sorry. You agree that the use of force is not guesswork? No, it's not. Or it's not guesswork. What do you mean by that? Or what does that mean? Well, you asked or, me I know. to agree. <laughs> um, you know, you do, you take the action based on your perception of the events and what you think is necessary rather than, well, let's see how this works. A shooting through a closed garage door, exactly, let's see how this works. Well, I'm sorry, for I, I don't agree with it in this, in this situation. Um, because the, the door was coming down at a time when the officers are trying, they've, they've made a decision based on what they see. It's going to take time for that, that um, their actions to occur. And in that time frame, circumstances are rapidly changing faster than the officer can keep up with. And that's, it's like you, you react in the past, you take action in the present, and your results will be in the very near future and you end up with these types of unfortunate events. Um, but it's because it's, everything is happening so fast and to, to sit and wait to see what happens invites the potential for, in the perception of the officers, a person with a pistol who opened the door and seems to have pointed it at a uniform deputy to wait until the shots are fired means that you're taking a chance on being shot first and, and not taking action. I stood on the other side of the door from you during the inspection, um, as did Mr. Jolly at one point. Do you know when Officer Lopez or Officer um, Newman would have been, I guess, visibly identifiable as an officer of the law? Or, um, I'd have to go, I, I wasn't looking at it from that perspective when you were, when I was there. I was interested in uh, other things, um, but I thought about it, and uh, they don't have stripes on their pants. We do have, generally have stripes on pants of officers in Canada. Um, so you wouldn't have an opportunity really to see until you could at least see their waistband. And it wouldn't matter how f far open the the door was as much as the door and the ability of Mr. Uh, Hill to see out. And I noticed that the door would go up relatively simply to a point and then it seemed to bind a little bit. If you wanted it opened it a bit more, you had to lift it a little harder again, uh, almost a second effort. So if the first one stopped, then you, you'd have to, to lean down to look out the door. But uh, they would be visible potentially by the basket weave of their uniform, uh, arguably by the color of their trousers and shirt. Uh, but again, it's just a green color. Uh, you wouldn't really be able to um, precisely determine who was there until you could see the, the star on the chest, the, the uh, emblems on the shoulders, uh, that sort of thing. Then it, then it should be clear by that point. But you'd, you, I would think you'd get some indication, at least if you lived in the area and knew how they dressed, you'd see the basket weave of the belt, that might be enough. Do we agree that neither officer, or really anyone, has indicated that the gun was pointed at them? Um, my recollection was that Lopez Newman said something about the gun at the height of the hip when he uh, started to fire. And I can't remember exactly how he said it, but Lopez said something to the effect that the gun was pointing at him and he thought he was gonna get shot. And the facts are what they are, but as I recall, they were um, toward and raising in the direction of. I Do you recall that one way or the other? I believe, or? I'm sorry, I believe that that was what Newman had said. But my recollection as I sit here today was Lo Lopez said something to the effect that as the gun came up, it was coming up and pointing towards me. I don't think, based on his explanation and my recollection, I don't think he believed that the gun was in that fashion, but the gun had certainly come up in this, this fashion, meaning for the record, uh, arm bent and then the barrel par parallel to the floor with the, with the muzzle pointing in his direction. Which, towards this direction. You know, and again, we don't use hindsight in these cases, but 
having <laughs> well, that's what everybody does. Um, it's 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 it would be consistent with that that second effort you were talking about, kind of needing two hands to get the door down the rest of the way to be reaching up in that direction. I didn't Four. say I didn't say you needed two hands to get the door up or two hands to get the door down. Okay. It required it would go up and then it seemed to bind and then you would have to have a second effort to get it if you really wanted it to go up and take a. a uh, a noticeable effort to get it to go all the way up. I never did try to go all the way up because I, I don't know if it would break it and I don't want to damage your property. Uh, bringing it down, you'd, it, it would take a considerable effort to pull the, the, the thing down. Two hands would help, but I, I think I would be able to get that door down quickly if I really yanked on it with one hand. And, and I'll produce the video that I took today, but in all of the video I took today, there were either two hands or three hands. Sometimes Mr. Jolly helped you on that door. Do you disagree and said that you no, I, opened it? I, and shut I, it I did. Don't go by me, though. I'm weak. I did use two hands. I also did use one hand when I was inside the door, and I used. I wanted to see if you could do it with one hand. But there's no sense in me sitting here telling you that you can open the door with one hand and you can't. Um, now it's not as easy with one hand as it would be with two, but I did go over to where Mr. Hill stand, and frankly. I did not think he was that far over until I got there. That's the value of doing a site visit compared to just looking at pictures. So I did purposely go over to that side of the door at one point and try to lift the door and <clears> found <throat> that it wasn't any more difficult than it was in the middle. But I did use two hands and I did use one hand. Did you find any inconsistency in your review of Officer Newman or Deputy Newman? I've been saying officer the entire time. Sorry, can you have to speak Sorry, yes. Yeah. I, that's, a, that's one of those looking down deals. Did you find any inconsistency in the um, description of the incident between Officer Newman and Officer Lopez? Or I can't think of one as I sit here. I know there was there was a, a, a difference in perspective. Um, as I said, Newman said he lost sight of the gun at around Hill's hip, and Lopez I think believed that the gun was pointed in his direction. So there was um, they weren't exactly matching, but I don't think there was any major discrepancies, at least not that I recall. Let's take a little break and then we should be wrapped up right after that. Off the record, 246. Back on the record, 252. What did you bring with you today? I brought the file that I uh, um, collected. Okay, could you case. run through? And I know we did it off the record, but yeah. I gave you fair warning that I'd probably have you do it again. If you could. Show me what you brought, give me a brief description, just kind of show it for the camera. Okay. That'd be great. This uh, first one says uh, um, 911 call, and it is the questions and answers based on um, what the dispatcher asked the original caller, I didn't know what her name was, the answer that was provided, the question, the answer, down, it's, it's relatively brief. That was based on what I was given initially. Then the second one is written in red ink. It says uh, times based on review of uh, operational comms, meaning the operational communications, and in black ink above it, it says info that Hill may be alive, and there's a series of times on the front and on the back, 
and those times are relative to the beginning time of the videotape or the audio tape rather than the time of day. Okay. How far into the makes sense recording that, that was. I uh, enlarged a. Uh, I believe. I think I enlarged this from an original that was disclosed, and I don't remember which one it was. And what I did with it was I uh, tried to take a ruler. Uh, that I have and line up the tail of the uh, defect with the center of the what I believe is the entrance point and then draw a straight line to see if they were parallel shots if they were coming up if they were going down I was trying to uh, find out whether the door was going up or going down at that time I couldn't draw any particular conclusions from this but it marks them with the distance over from the one side and the distance up, as mentioned in the uh, report. So they're there, uh, the numbers are in red, one, two, three, four, from the bottom up. And uh, uh, beside it, it says, uh, this says head wound. These two in the middle, it's marked abdomen. And then this one says uh, bullet trapped and recovered. So that's the one that was trapped in that uh, door hinge mechanism. You made those designations before today, is that fair? Yes. And did you take any measurements today? I didn't because the measurements were taken today. Okay. No ruler? Or, I'm, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. The measurements were already taken, and there's uh, somebody did that some time ago. So I, the bullet, they're the same holes. I didn't bother. No ruler, no force, no trajectory um, or, or force necessary uh, to, to pull up or pull down. None of those measurements were taken today. I don't have any device that would do that. Okay. Uh, what else do you have? Okay. My report which uh, I believe you have a copy of. I do. And then there's a ser one series here that starts with T1. And most of these documents say St. Lucie across the top, um, just so I keep them clear. It starts with T1, goes through, and on the back it says T1A, and then T2, T2A, and it goes up to T11, and there's a line across the bottom. There's nothing on the back of... 11A, there's no 11A, and it's, they are basically uh, things that were said on the eight hour long uh, recording of the radio communication that was the operational channel on, at the time of this event, and the times that are beside it are the times based from the beginning of the recording forward, not what time of the day that is. Okay, so they're not, it's not necessarily verbatim in every case, and it's not, uh, those times aren't Precise. I can't remember if that was the beginning or when they finished saying it, I wrote the number down. But if you go to that time frame and go a few moments either way, you'll, you'll see these, uh, these comments that are made. Okay. So that's that separate one there. And then the last one I have uh, starts with number one, and again on the back it says 1A, 2, 2A, and it goes up to uh, 7A. Um, and they re this represents the transcript of... Newman and Lopez's statement, not a, not, a, not a complete transcript the way the reporter's taking it, but this is what they basically said, so I, w I would have a copy of the gist of what they said. And in some cases, I did put question and answer and tried to be fairly precise. This was um, their statements and walkthrough. So one is a statement taken on the 14th, and the other one was the uh, next page is the walkthrough taken on the 15th. And the same thing with uh, Lopez's initial interview on the f 15th. And then uh, there were some secondary questions. They stopped asking questions of Lopez and then they asked a couple more. And then they did a walkthrough at the scene. I didn't write down what date that was, but this is just a transcript of the, of the audio recording. As I said before, I didn't know that their actual transcript was buried somewhere else in the file, uh, so I did that. And on page 7A, there are times taken from the PowerPoint that was a part of the uh, material that I reviewed, and I've got uh, times when they were 10-7 both on the scene, times for shots fired, and I've just done some calculations based on how much time there was between each of those times, how many seconds. Um, and then when the, the time the Caltech was mentioned on the radio, the time the Glock was mentioned on the radio, uh, an incident report number, the subject, um, his birth date, and he was 30 years old, and then uh, how many cartridges ma uh, Newman had left in his magazine, the description of the Caltech with the serial number in his right rear pocket, 
um, that the, a DNA swabbing had been done, um, that what he was wearing, Mr. Hill was wearing black t-shirt, jeans, and shorts, and then the same numbers relative to the height of the defect and the distance over from the one wall okay. um, that was there. So that's and that, that's it. Anything else in the green folder? No. Anything, anything on the green folder? It just says uh, St. Lucie SO. Okay. Uh, obviously, you, you have some stuff that didn't make the flight with you back at, back at your office, I assume, the depositions and all that? Oh, that's, yeah, that's okay. um, uh, the stuff that I, it was given electronically. I, Certainly. Yeah. Did, did you get anything paper, any part of this file paper? I don't think I did. I think everything either came by email or came through a Dropbox because okay. it was some of the some of the material was uh, a, a large file size, and I don't think I got anything in the mail. I don't think anything came by courier. If it did, I it wasn't very much. It's fine. Um, I'd like to attach a color photocopy of the materials you brought with you today. I don't care how that's done, whether whether it can be done here or, or attached or the PDF you get it back to us. Sorry. The PDF I recall should have been in color. I don't know if you if you printed it in color, but I'm pretty sure the PDF that I used scanned everything in color. Um, yeah, that's blue. Okay, so it, it may be have been produced. It looks like it was produced in color. So you may have it right okay. there. Okay. Let me just so we know what you had with you at the deposition. Just attach a copy. I probably do have that. Um, but I don't know. I don't know that I do. I think I just got the report. I wish I had an answer for you. I do not. I will make sure if you were to get this, and I'm beginning to think you were, that I will get it to you. It will be scanned and forwarded to you. Not later than tomorrow. Right. I'm still going to attach a copy, color copy for purposes of today. How are we going to do that, though? He's taking it with him. See, Kathy? All right. I didn't Wonderful. want to impose. Come on, come on. Get, we're going to make a copy yeah, before we leave. Um, any other opinions that we haven't discussed that aren't otherwise in your report as it relates to this case? I, I can't think of one, um, as I sit here now, um, you know, if, if you ask me for something that I didn't anticipate in court, uh, certainly, I, 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 there's no way I can know that. But <clears throat> um, nothing that I can think of right now. Has your opinion been stricken uh, by Daubert or Fry analysis um, or any other state? Sorry, can you speak up? Has again? your opinion been stricken by any court of law? I don't believe so. Have you been prohibited to testify in any court of law in the United States? No. There was a case in Chicago where the court said that the, because I wouldn't, I wasn't willing to be as precise as the other expert, that they didn't think my evidence would be helpful. After they got through cross-examining the other expert, it became apparent <laughs> what value my evidence would be. I was on a plane on the way back to testify the next day, and the end result was an agreement between the parties to put my evidence in as a stipulation in this uh, federal civil case in Chicago. So there was that instance. I don't know of any other case where there's been a Daubert challenge where I've been excluded from testifying. And what I'm trying to understand is uh, we get expert disclosures in these cases, and on the non-retained experts, there's some degree of what that person's going to testify to. In yours, it says, in compliance with Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 26, attached here to as Exhibit A is the expert report of Chris Lawrence, his CV, recent depositions and trial testimony list, and the fee schedule for work as an expert witness. It is expected that he will testify in this case and give opinions consistent with the report. 
Uh, and, and so, well, that's weird. I guess Siri thinks I said her name. Um, it, what are you, what have you testified to? I mean, police training, police procedures, use of force, um, you know, what I'm trying to understand is what is your, what is your expertise? For well, I've given evidence on police procedures, police uh, use of force, police training, and within that, um, I use comments relative to how long certain things take based on examining experienced officers and the research consistent with that, and some other, I've provided foundations for all of my opinions where foundations are available. Um, I guess it, it, might ha it might help to understand uh, where I where I come from in respect to the jurisdiction I normally have done a lot of work in. Um, we had a person get up and say that they were an expert in a particular field, and the end result was a bunch of people went to jail. Later when that expert's testimony was evaluated, they found out that it wasn't as reliable as it had been, and some injustices uh, were created. As a result, the courts in Ontario have stated that the experts role is to assist the trier of fact, not to just bolster one side, because that's what happened in this other case. It was criminal, it was criminal matters and people went to jail that shouldn't have went to jail. So my perspective has been to assist the court, not just to adopt the, pers the, the uh, version offered by one side or the other, but to assist them in understanding uh, what it's like to do this job, what people can do and can't do, what they're generally told, what they're not told, what we know, what we don't know, and how long some of these things take because we've measured certain things so that the jury can better appreciate the evidence as they hear it. Also, maybe why, I believe it helps them understand why two or three people can see the same event and maybe come up with some different versions. And there's good reason for it. That's really what I'm, I believe I'm supposed to be doing is helping the trier of fact, in this case probably the jury, not the judge, um, understand the evidence so they can make sense of it. So uh, that's why we talk about police procedures and those sorts of things, but I wanted to assure the court that I am not making something up. Just trust me, I'm the expert, I know what I'm talking about, it's okay. I indicated on the back of my report three pages of reference material where if you don't believe what I'm saying is correct, you can read the research material yourself and see how, if I'm wrong. Right. Uh, th that's really what I do. And uh, my experience has been that juries have found it quite helpful. Okay. And, and kind of, I guess, the reason I ask is you, you do venture into areas of almost a medical examiner, into biomechanics, um, into uh, almost some form of medical opinions. And I, I haven't seen where you have uh, a, a qualified basis to render those opinions. And, and this is where you can disagree with me if you, if you think you, you should. But, the, you know, the, um, I'm not trying to tell you what happened. I'm trying to tell you what we know, what's recorded in reliable sources about this kind of an event. Because um, it was really a, uh, I can't remember if she was a Superior Court Justice or a Court of Appeal Justice, but the justice basically, I went to a seminar on um, using in, uh, experts put on by a law school, and one particular justice said, if the world was perfect, neither side would call an expert. I would call the expert and say, I don't understand this. What does it mean? Uh, uh, this makes no sense to me. Why are they saying these things? What's it, like, can, can you do this? And when she said that, it was like an epiphany. Now I know what my role is. I'm not supposed to say this is justified or not justified. I'm supposed to help the triers of fact understand the issues that surround this, these types of events so that they can make the decision on whether what happened should have happened or not happened, whether it was too much or not enough or, or lawful. And in that regard, it has to do with, um, you know, why do you shoot more than once? Well, just because a person has a fatal wound doesn't mean that it's instantly fatal. It doesn't mean they're incapacitated immediately. Did this, was Mr. Hill incapacitated? You'd have to ask a doctor. But I know that shots to the chest, even shots to the head, do not instantly incapacitate unless certain features have been identified, and that comes out of 
reliable forensic uh, medicine textbooks and shooting reconstruction textbooks and police-related textbooks on firearms. Um, so it's within the, the uh, literature that I have reviewed, it's within the police-related training literature. Um, but I'm not going to tell you that Mr. Hill could or couldn't do anything. I'm simply saying I know that we fire more than one shot because despite the fact that it may be a head wound, despite the fact that it may be lethal, unless it goes through the brain stem or transects the spine between two particular vertebrae, movement, continued movement is possible. They need to know that. Right. And if you have a, an expert that's going to get up who's a, a doctor and say, oh, no, he, destroy, he destroyed the, you know, the brain stem and that, that, that's what happened, and he, this would have been, well, that's his area of expertise. Would you, would you defer to a medical examiner in this case? If a medical examiner said that's what happened, then that's in his uh, or her, um, th that's on their dime. And if they're not correct or they're misstating the, the uh, facts or what the li research literature says, well, that's at their own risk. Have you written any papers or been peer-reviewed on any issues related to um, intoxication and what someone can do or not do? No, uh, I've written peer-reviewed papers, but not on that topic. Okay. Same question as to uh, the, the biomechanics of injury, uh, meaning a portion of the body is injured and what somebody can do or not do with that injury. I've written some papers, but unfortunately they're classified and I can't discuss them and they're on ballistics, and they're on uh, terminal ballistics, and strike, a bullet striking a body. Okay, so if I ask you for those documents, you would tell me that you cannot provide them I, to me. I cannot provide well, you them. you would have to kill <laughs> no. In fact, I used to put that, I used to put the, uh, the source of that documentation on my CV, I don't do it anymore, because it's, it's classified, and after I thought about it, I thought, you know, I shouldn't even be, so I can't discuss it. And I understand. And if I can't, but if I can't look at it and a judge can't look at it, that's an and issue for the pull, case. I can't pull it out and okay. start talking about it. I think that's, that's all I have. I, I hit my two hour mark. Um, read or wave? He will not wave. I will take a copy if ordered. If it is ordered, if you will send the errata sheet to me, I will ensure that it gets to him to make whatever corrections need to be made. I'm sure there won't be any. And I think that covers everything. I'll take a copy. Yes, I Position is concluded at 311.